Got two for the price of one tonight. It's great to be able to be with you. The only trouble is, it's impossible to talk about what the Lord has done for us in half an hour. To get seven, over 70 years of life into that period of time is an impossibility because the Lord has done so much for both of us. So what we're going to do is very simply keep it simple by each of us telling you how we came, first of all, to know the Lord as our Saviour. And then in the next part, as it were, we're simply going to talk just a little bit about our time spent in the Middle East and tell one or two stories from that time there that illustrates the goodness of God. So without further ado, I'm going to hold o hand over to my, my good wife here. Thank you. Right. Well, it is a privilege actually to be here and to be asked to share what God has done for us. And it's called a testimony. So, a little while back, we were asked by another church to actually share our testimony with them as well. So that too was a privilege. But as I thought, what is a testimony? How does the scriptures view a testimony? What is our thinking of a testimony? Well, in the law courts, a testimony is a written or spoken statement that something is true. So what is a Christian's testimony? It's about sharing the story of what Christ has done for us. It's not about what we have achieved or what we have done. It's what Christ has done for us and particularly that precious word that's called salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. If it wasn't for what he did on the cross, we wouldn't be here now meeting together. And it's finding and it's knowing Christ and then walking according to the word of Christ, the living word of Christ, the example that he set for us. So my testimony is to tell the story of how we first became Christians how we found salvation through Jesus Christ, how God's guidance and presence has helped and supported us through the ups and downs of daily life. Sometimes, of course, testimonies refer to specific events that have happened. Um, for instance, like healing from sicknesses, from diseases, family problems, and that, too, enables us to have a word of thanks for what God has done. But a testimony is something that's ongoing. It's not once in a lifetime. It comes and it goes. A testimony is ongoing. It's the work of God in our lives from the time we accept him as our Lord and Savior till the time we go to be with him. So... A little bit about me. Now, I knew Christ from quite an early age. I was brought up in a Christian family, went to church regularly, attended Sunday school. Thank God for Sunday schools. I know we have struggled here, but it was through the Sunday school and my Sunday school teacher that I accepted the Lord. So I'm all in favor of having Sunday schools for children and teaching them the ways of the Lord. And it was there that I actually invited Christ into my life. And I was around 10 or 11 years of age at the time. And what did that mean to me? Well, I knew from that young age that there was a difference in my life. I knew, of course, uh, that something had happened to me, that Christ was actually with me, 
But beyond that, really, what did it matter to me? I still went to church. We had fantastic teachers in that church that we belonged to. And I praise God for the teaching that I had while growing up. But it wasn't till my mid-teens that doubts began to fill my mind. Was this something that I was following because my parents had done it and grandparents were Christians? Was God really real? Is the Bible really true? I was in my mid-teens and I wanted answers. And a lot of our young people, when they ask questions, please be patient because they are looking for answers and I was looking for answers. But you see, I couldn't ask my parents. I couldn't ask my parents. They were believers, but I couldn't ask them the things that were going through my mind. I didn't know how they would receive it. And my father was exceptionally strict. If I said to him, I'm not going to church, oh my goodness, that would have been like saying, I'm leaving home, I don't want anything to do with you. No way would he have allowed it. So I knew that was not on. I had to go to church, I had to sit through church, I took a notebook with me, and often I drew some comic strip pictures of some of the precious people that were sitting around me. And that was my way of, in a sense, denying what I wasn't sure about. But my ears were not closed, nor were my eyes shut. I could still see, I could still hear while I was there through the church. But one day I said to myself, I said, okay, if there is a God, I want to know him. I'm not just going to walk away. How do I get to know him? Well, if the Bible is what they say it is, the word of God, then I need to start reading it. So I prayed and I said, God, if you are real, if this Bible is what the Christians claim it is, the word of God, then I'll start reading it from cover to cover. And I was a teenager at the time. By the time I reached the end of it, if I have found you within the pages of this word, I will serve you for the rest of my life. But that's my agreement with you. Every day, I read, I prayed. Every Every day, I would find a space where the family, we were a big family, I could be alone. I spent that time reading, just reading and reading. I had no notes that I was following, but I had a notebook where I kept things that I felt would be of importance to me. It took me 12 months to read the Bible from cover to cover as a teenager. And it was through that time that I had a, an encounter with God that would be hard to explain because through that time, I found this Lord that I had committed my life to as a 10, 11 year old. And he wasn't just someone up there. He is someone who is so great that our minds are not big enough to even have a little of him. That's why he sent Jesus, our Lord, his son, so that through Jesus we would understand who the Father is. And it's Jesus that set us the example of life and lived the word of God to us. So... This was, I was armed with my new concrete relationship through.
through that year. I knew that was solid and I knew I could never walk away from what I had found. Faith was real and not fictional. My trust in my Heavenly Father had deepened and strengthened. Now, I didn't just have a God, I had a Heavenly Father who was real to me. Now, that year was the pivotal foundation of a lifelong pattern of spending regular time alone with, with the one that I love and always have done. So I would urge everyone here, if you've not established a pattern of getting together with the Lord on a daily basis, alone with him, his time, no matter what you're doing, when my children were little and babies, no matter what time I got up to have time with the Lord, they were up also. It was so hard. But I knew there was a time when they slept in the day. And even though the washing was there, the dishes were in the kitchen waiting to be done, food needed cooking, but everything had to stop while they were asleep. That was the time that I had alone. And I needed that time with my Heavenly Father because that's where my strength came from. And I wanted to know my father on a daily basis because he's always been so precious to us. So, does that mean that life became a garden of smooth-stemmed roses without any prickles that tore the skin of my hands? Not at all. Not at all. Life, work, marriage, family, church each with their own complexities and challenges, are still present with us today, and we all face them in different ways. But I know whom I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed to him until the day that he returns. And that is a very brief, short testimony. Okay. We'll be hearing from Doreen again later. On a Sunday evening, 70 years ago, on the 13th of December, I gave my heart to Jesus. I can visualize the time now. I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were believers. And like Doreen, I had to go to church. Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday evening. And this particular Sunday evening, I tried to pull a sickie because I didn't want to go. And we went there and I pulled a sickie and they brought me home. And I wanted to read a book. It was a Christian book. And in that book, there was something in there that triggered me. I already knew about sin. I knew that I was a sinner, even as a, a little primary school child. And I knew that I needed Jesus in my heart and life. And there, in my bedroom, I gave my heart to the Lord. And uh, he has been with me ever since. Often I failed him, but he has never failed me. And like Doreen, in my teenage years, there were questions, and I'm thankful that I had a good group of fellow um, teenagers who we did things together, a Christian group. Not all, of, not all of them were Christians, but the majority were, and we had great Christian leaders who brought us God's word. And at that time, I was also baptized when I was about 16 years old. And at around about that time, there was a growing conviction that the Lord had a plan for me in my life and that part of that plan was that somewhere or other I would go abroad and live abroad for a time. And that remained with me for quite a, quite a time, but it gradually went into the background. But 
then things changed. I went off to college. It was the year 1964. And it's a, a year that stands in my mind because two very important things happened. One was I made a trip to the Middle East, a three-month trip on a Lambretta scooter <laughs> all the way there. And traveling through over the continent, through Turkey, into Syria, and Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, it had a great impact on my life. And uh, that impact was to show through later. At that time, I didn't know what that impact would be, but uh, looking back, I can see that it did have this great impact. But the other important thing in 1964 was that I met my wife. And so that was a, a very good year that stands in my mind. Well, the rest is, as it were, history. A few years later, we got married. We lived in London. I was teaching in a school, big comprehensive school, 2,500 boys, known as one of the worst places in London to teach. It was great, though. Doreen was working in a bank, uh, and uh, we had, by that time, two, two children. And it was, then we decided, and I, I don't know how it came about, but it was time for us to move out of London. And so I looked for a, a, a job, and uh, I saw a, a notice in the Times Educational Supplement. A school in Hereford wanted a committed practicing Christian as, one, as, a, as a head of the department there. So I applied and got that, and it was great. And we th I thought that, right, we're, we're made, we're going to be here for years and years and years. But the Lord had other plans, because four years later, we left. But while we were in London, we came to meet and came to become close friends with a Turkish man. He was quite a phenomenal man, and uh, he had three kidneys. He had to have a kidney transplant, and that's why we got to know him. And sadly, after a few years, he, he died. And at his memorial service, George Verver, who headed up um, Operation Mobilization, which some of you will have heard of, was speaking. And at that, God spoke to me that he wanted us to go to the Middle East and work for him. It wasn't what we'd planned. We'd been seeking other avenues to work abroad where we would make lots of money. But the Lord had other ideas. We came out of that meeting and Doreen turned to me and said, what did you make of that? Because the Lord's told us, told me that we've got to, and it was the same for me. The Lord spoke to us in that way. And so, in a sense, that's how we came to go to the the, the Middle East and so a short time later or it was about a, a, a year and a half later we set out for Jordan we spent uh, 18 months in Jordan doing language study and culture study uh, perhaps if we had time we could talk about some of the intricacies of that and after that we moved on to Lebanon and uh, we were there for just, just over four years. It was during the years of the Civil War. And there I was teaching, and Doreen did some teaching in the, a school for blind there. And also we were heavily involved in, in church work, Doreen particularly with ladies groups and, and children work there. But the time came when we could no longer educate our children in Lebanon. And I was asked whether we would move to Cyprus and that I would set up a video production uh, facility and distribution and uh, um, post-production distribution center and produce Christian films in, on video in Arabic. And uh, I was asked to look into the intricacies of perhaps doing this and, the, uh, and uh, this is what we then did for the, the next six or seven years before we came back to UK. So that's just a, a brief outline of our life there. And I'm going to hold, hand over to Doreen now to, to say a little bit about some of our time there. Doreen. 
I've got lots of pieces of paper. It's all right, we're not going to use them all. Now, it was quite an experience for us, landing in Jordan. We'd been exempt from going to the All Nations Bible College because the mission society that we went with, all their personnel had to have minimum of two years Bible college. So we were due, we knew we would be heading for the Bible college. But it so happened that the principal of this Bible college was on the interviewing panel and after we had been grilled for a long time, it came back to us that they felt we did not need to go to a Bible college. We could go straight to Jordan and begin our two year studies there, which we would have had to do after the Bible college. So it meant four years of study before we were on the mission field. But because we had children, we were exempt from going there on the basis of our church backgrounds and what we had been involved with. It was a dramatic change arriving in Jordan. Now, I talked about the stem of roses being smooth, but our time there was very prickly, especially having three children with us, the youngest being nine months only. Daily living proved an absolute challenge. Coping with intense heat, learning how to economize on our limited water supply. One cubic tank to last us the week for five of us. Shopping for groceries and meat was a story in itself. But worst of all was our lack of communication with the people in the Arabic language. We had no Arabic language at all. I had tried even before we went with the mission society. I had had a love for the Arabic language and desperately wanted to learn. So I decided to do a course in the Arabic language. But David didn't encourage me. He said, you've got no one to practice it with. You'll just waste your time, don't. So when this opportunity came for us to go abroad, I was delighted because I so wanted to learn Arabic. Now, this particular day, we were still fairly new in this flat that we had, I needed something from the grocery shop, the little corner shop just up the road from us. So I sat down, got my notebook pad, and worked out in the Arabic language, in the phonetic Arabic, how I should ask the shopkeeper for what I wanted. So off I went, feeling fairly confident with the script in my hand, and babbled to the shopkeeper, my double Dutch. He stared at me confused. He didn't understand a word of what I said to him, but nor did I have a clue of what I had said either. Oh dear, embarrassing and frustrating, but this is how it went on but we learned to come, overcome the embarrassments because if we showed too much embarrassment, we would never learn. So we had to laugh when they laughed and it was lovely. And we just loved the people that surrounded us. They were just the most wonderful community and they were just so lovely, we could have just lived amongst them. We were living in a poorer area of Jordan but 
the people could not have welcomed us more than they did. And the first people that invited us for a meal, actually, was the shopkeeper and his wife. <laughs> so it was lovely. We got to know them well. But um, it's amazing, isn't it, what sign language and a few pointing of fingers can do. I got what I wanted from that shop and came home as quickly as I could. But I was feeling totally inadequate, and I was not happy. Yes, the calling of God had been so definite. We knew, and we knew God had called us. There was no doubt about that at all. But just being there, living, coping, not being able to communicate was very, very hard. And this particular day, I was extremely low, and I just cried out to the Lord. And I said, Lord, why did you bring us here? We can't even speak their language. We're less than little children. Of what use are we to you or to the people around us? We felt, I just felt so useless. Again, full of doubts and frustrations, I began to grapple with the thought that, uh, Lord, had you really called us? Did we make a mistake? Did we hear the voice of God? Repeating over and over the frustrating situation that we were in. Perhaps we hadn't heard the Lord after all. Perhaps we were mistaken. But you know, it's through these times, and God allows these times to come into our lives, times of deep frustration where you do not know where you are. Has God left you? Why isn't he there? You so believe that what you were doing was right, but it doesn't seem that God is in it. These are times God allows. Why does he allow them is the question. And through that time, the Lord showed me a lesson that I would never have learned or understood if we had not faced that situation. If I said to you that God opened my ma mind to a truth that as yet I hadn't acknowledged or understood. You see, we lived on the third floor of a block of flats. There were two flats on each floor. So our front door was adjacent to the next flat. And it was considered rude if we locked our front door while we were in the flat. So our front door was never locked. Anybody could come in and out of the house. Now, I wonder if you know what's coming next. New neighbors moved in to us, next door to us, with three daughters. We had three little boys. They had three daughters, almost very similar ages to what our children were. Lovely couple. Jojo and Labib, we grew to love this couple and their children. But my neighbor, with my door being unlocked, regularly walked uninvited into our flat. Whenever she wished, several times a day, with her children. Okay? She spoke no English, and I didn't have the Arabic. The children were in their element. They sat on the floor playing and talking to one another. Our little one in English, their little ones in Arabic, but they understood one another. And it was very heavy on me, again, this continuous open door, continuous person in, continuous children in, and I had to feed them when they were there, when it was time to feed ours as well. So it wasn't easy. But the thought came to me because part of our learning Arabic, the Arabic school that we attended, I couldn't attend because our nine-month-old 
child just would not stay with a child minder. So in the end, I had to have private lessons in Arabic with a teacher from the school, but I could not go to school. Sometimes we would use John's Gospels in Arabic and they were part of the teaching and draw comparisons between the English and the Arabic and it was a wonderful way of learning the language through the scriptures. So I got two of these John's Gospels at home and as Jojo came in with her children they sat playing, I made a cup of tea, I brought out two John's Gospels, one for her, one for me. And I said, Jojo, Will you help me to read? She could see my reading was coming on, but it was very slow. But she could read. So she began to read, and I would follow in my little one. What I hadn't realized through this time was that God had opened a way for my language development with this neighbor that was way beyond what I would have had if it wasn't for my neighbor coming in so regularly. You see, I was there thinking that because I didn't have the language and I couldn't communicate, that I wasn't witnessing for the Lord. We were there because the Lord had called us and, you know, we should be out and about amongst these people and I wasn't and this was frustrating me. But God showed me, no, you stay home, read with your neighbor, she is your teacher, but then this is what I hadn't grasped. She is reading the word of God. The greatest testimony that we could give to anyone is to put the word of God in their hands and get them to read it. And there she is reading this word of God and that thought hadn't hit me until the Lord showed me that you've been obedient to my call and you are here. You're not the one doing the work of evangelizing. It's the Holy Spirit through you. The Holy Spirit through you. You're obedient. You've handed my word to this lady and she is reading it. And my word is the evangelist, not you. Wow. That thought hit me so hard. So hard. What is the saying? Two birds with one stone. There is the Lord teaching me the language. There is the Lord teaching this lady his word. And when I saw the goodness of God through that, again, it was like a cornerstone going deep into the soil of my heart. Yes, Lord. I know you're in charge. Thank you. Have your way. Just help me to be humble and obedient in what you're doing. You see, the word of God says obedience is better than sacrifice. We had been obedient to his call. We were out there. And he was working in us and through us without us having to do very much. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Time's running on a pace. Only time for one more story. But during lockdown, I wrote something like 40 stories about God's goodness, the testimony of how God answered prayer, how God kept us safe during the Civil War, during Lebanon as we traveled about how God provided for our every need in different ways. And so you'll have to wait to the autumn if you want to read those. <laughs> but one more concerning the video work. You see, it was something that was brand new to the Christian community. 
In the Middle East, there were video machines, video players everywhere. And there were video shops, uh, shops lending videos to people everywhere. In England, that wasn't the case. I remember coming back on deputation to England and standing in a church of two or three hundred people and saying, how many of you have got a video machine? No hands went up. I said, come on, be <coughs> truthful. There's nothing wrong in having one. And one or two hands gently went up, but that was all. So it was very dif different. And it was very new. And therefore, getting funds to do this work was going to be quite a challenge. You see, it costs a lot. But we pressed ahead in looking into the possibility of what we could do. And the first thing that we were going to do was to subtitle some 13 Christian films into Arabic. And I wrote to a producer of these films in the United States asking permission to use the films and also requesting how much it would cost us in royalties or that sort of thing. I had been over to Egypt and arranged for those to do the subtitling and how long it would take and, and all, all the technicalities of getting them back to Cyprus and then distributing them. All this work had been done and I'd worked out that it was going to cost something like $10,000 to get started. Now at that time, that would be equivalent in today's money of about 50, 60,000 pounds, a, a tremendous amount of money. And we had $10 in our fund there in the, in, in the treasurer's account in Cyprus. And I went off to Egypt to do some other exploratory work and felt very strongly that a decision had to be made as to whether we would proceed with this. I'd been working on it for a time, and you couldn't work on something too long without either going ahead with it or saying, no, it's not for us. And I was musing this over in my mind, what should we do, what should we do? And on the plane back from Egypt, I made a decision that we should go ahead and uh, arrived back in the office in Cyprus, I was there back in the office in the afternoon and there's a whole stack of mail on my desk and I began to open it. Oh, one from the States. Let's see what this is. Open the letter. Yes, use our films. You can use them free of charge. We're only too happy to have them used. Thank you, Lord. That's great. And uh, a little bit later, our treasurer came over and said, David, I've got some news for you. He said, we've just had a gift in for the video work. It's taken three months to get here because of the, well, I'll tell you why later. It's taken three months to get here, but it's here. I said, how much is it? Come on, tell me. He says, it's a lot of money. I said, no, tell me. He says, it's $9,900, which, again, is exactly what we needed. And it was from Christians in the absolute heartland of the Muslim world. It was from Christians in Saudi Arabia. They had got to hear of what we hoped to do. And in their, Christ in their Easter offering, they had put into their collection plate or bag or whatever it was, this money for us to use. And to get to us, it had to go back to the States and through various bank accounts and so on before it could come to us. The Lord provided absolutely everything that we needed. And this could be repeated again and again and again. And so we see the hand of the Lord in what was being done. And we just thank him for that. Just in closing... On many occasions in my life, people have encouraged me with a verse of scripture found in the book of 
Proverbs. You all know it. In the old King James Version translation, it reads as follows. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. But you know, the paraphrase of the Message Bible gives a certain added clarity to this injunction because it reads as follows. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go, and he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Throughout our lives together, Doreen and I have always sought to trust in the Lord and to listen to God's voice. And I'm the first to admit that I've often failed to trust and listen on many occasions, but he's always reminded me and been true to his promise found in Hebrews 13.5. Again, you will know it, and I believe it was prayed earlier this evening, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I've always hold on to that promise of God, and he's always directed our paths and kept us on the right track and safely led us through times of conflict and fighting during the times in the civil war in Lebanon. As I mentioned earlier, over the, over the past, as it were, few years, I've written some 40 short stories about our time abroad. As I came to the end of writing these stories, I was reading in the Bible book, of Deuteronomy in chapter 4 verse 9 and found that it explained exactly why I'd first put pen to paper or more accurately fingers of the keyboard um, to produce the short stories of the accounts of our life abroad. And then I turned again to the paraphrase of the Living Bible and felt that it summed up my thinking and desire even more accurately. And in a sense this is why we give testimonies. Those words in, De in um, Deuteronomy read, but watch out, be careful, never forget what you have seen God doing for you. May his miracles have a deep and permanent effect upon your lives. Tell your children and your grandchildren about the glorious miracles he did. When I started writing these stories, I write, uh, started with the expectation of writing just a few short pieces for the benefits of my family. But as I wrote, many more temporarily and sometimes long forgotten instances came to mind. I realized that the many occasions of the Lord's help and intervention in our affairs had indeed had a deep and permanent effect on our lives. After all, when God performs a miracle in our lives, we can never, ever forget it or be unchanged by it. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, I encourage you to look back on your lives and see and acknowledge the hand of God in different situations you have faced and gone through, and it will be an encouragement to you, I guarantee and if you've not yet been born again, I encourage you to ask Jesus into your life so that you too can have the thrill of seeing God perform miracles in your life. Time has gone. We were going to say if there are any questions, you can. we'll try and answer them, but uh, you can catch us afterwards if you want to. <laughs>